Good evening, and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Snohomish County Forum for Candidates for the position of State Senator, Legislative District 38. My name is Nadine Shanti. I am your moderator, and I am also a member of the League of Women Voters of Snohomish County. Candidates for State Senator for uh, Legislative District 38 are Anita Azariah, Bernard Moody, and June Robinson. As always, the League has invited all candidates and all have responded and they are with us this evening. The League thanks all candidates for running for office, for agreeing to serve if elected, and for participating in this forum this evening. It is the policy of the League to be nonpartisan. Therefore, we neither endorse nor oppose candidates or parties. We do take positions on issues that we have studied and on which we have re reached consensus. The ground rules for this forum were sent ahead of time to all candidates, and they have agreed to abide by the stated rules of decorum and will refrain from interrupting, personal attacks, or disruptive behavior. These rules will be strictly enforced. So let me briefly explain the question and answer period rules. Questions have not been shared with candidates ahead of time. And we thank all of those community members who sent us recommendations about local issues. I will pose the questions. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond. Additional or less time may be allowed for selected questions. And I will state this change clearly. We are using a countdown timer, which is visible to all candidates. It shows the elapsed time and alerts a candidate when there are 15 seconds left and also when time is up. Time li limits on answers will be strictly enforced. When you see the timer turn red and you hear the chime, your time is up. I will change the starting order for each question rotating through the candidates to ensure a random and fair sequence. The order for the first question will be as follows. Anita Azariah, Bernard Moody, and then June Robinson. Let's begin. The first question goes to Anita Azariah. What qualifications and experiences make you a strong candidate for this position? Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me for this forum. Uh, I am an immigrant. I uh, landed is, in this wonderful country 29 years ago and made Snohomish County my home. And since then, I have been heavily invested in this community. I have worked with several different departments like Child Protective Services, Department of Early Learning, real estate, uh, recreational industry, education as a child development specialist. I worked as a guardian at Lightham. I worked uh, as a mediator, as a supervisor. So I worked uh, with different people from different walks of life. And um, coming from another country, I also understand diversity, the cultural diversity that this country um, is so proud of. And it has all people from all over the world. Um, I have also spent hundreds of volunteer hours. Um, I have invested that in, in this community, working um, with Children's Snohomish County Children's Commission as a commissioner, uh, as a board member of Pakistan Association of Greater Seattle in different churches and uh, with the Snohomish County Republican Party. So I believe that uh, with my professional and my volunteer experience, I do understand the issues that this community has and I can bring sustainable solutions to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moody, your response? You're muted. Mr. Moody? There we go. Okay. Thank you. Yes. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Bernard Moody, and thank you very much for inviting me to the, the forum. Um, I have uh, 25 years experience as a sergeant for the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office 
I've been in the field for over 34 years. I have experience working in both the states of Washington prison system as well as the state of Hawaii prison system. I am also a former Marine where I joined when I was 17 years old, giving me a total of 45 years of working experience in my career or chosen career path. Every one of these paths has always led me to some type of service and or community um, support. Um, I'm a member and an elder of my church. I go to the Reach Church down here in Everett. Um, I lived and worked and raised my family exclusively in the 38th district ever since I moved here in 1997. And in fact, I used to live across the street from June Robinson. <laughs> I, am, um, <clears throat> I am passionate about the things that I believe in and the things that I do. My work ethic is that I want to improve or make better wherever I'm at. I believe that my diverse uh, background and, and extensive work experience has given me the demonstration of being able to show that I have proven solutions to many of the problems and, and things that we have in our community. And I have lived in our community long enough to say that these issues have affected me and I will be able to bring a solution that is known, not only mine, but my constituents. Thank you. Ms. Robinson, same question. Thank you. Thank you for having me this evening. June Robinson, a candidate for state Senate in the 38th legislative district. I too have um, lived in the 38th district in Everett for 25 plus years. I raised my family here. I've had a long career in uh, health and human services, mostly in the 38th legislative district. I worked for many years at Community Health Center of Snohomish County. I was the executive director of the Housing Consortium of Everett and Snohomish County, where I did advocacy for affordable housing. I've worked with local public health. And I am currently the Senator for the 38th Legislative District. I've served um, <clears throat> seven years in the State House uh, in the 30, for the, representing the people of the 38th District. And then two years ago was appointed and subsequently elected to be the Senator, um, again, representing the people of the 38th Legislative District. I've uh, had great success representing this community. I've sponsored bills that uh, have allowed us to have paid family leave in our state. I've worked on housing issues, healthcare. I currently uh, serve as vice chair of the Ways and Means Committee in the Senate. So I uh, play a big role in writing our state's budget and have, that has allowed me to look out particularly for the needs of Snohomish County and the 38th District in that process. Thank you. Mr. Moody, we'll start with you for this question. What are two or three major issues that need to be addressed by the legislature? Well, the very first ones, we need to get in there and change the laws that have put handicap or put handcuffs on law enforcement. Um, the safety of our community is probably the most important and paramount issue that uh, any legislators or uh, leaders of communities could possibly have, because if you don't have a safe community, then nothing else matters. Uh, secondly would be the economy and the affordability of uh, what it costs for a family to live and thrive within the district. And uh, the third thing I would believe would be uh, the drugs, alcohol, and mental health issues and the homeless issues that are plaguing our communities. By me being a member of um, the correctional field that I have been in for so many years, these are the very people that I have worked with and for um, all the time that I've been serving in my career. I have uh, listened to and understood the problems that they had and understand also the solutions and I also seen what has worked and what has not worked. Um, I believe the most important thing that we can do is give peace of mind and safety for and to our community and citizens. And until we fix the laws that the legis current legislators have passed that have caused most of the problems that we have in the 38th, I don't think that we're gonna be able to have a sustainable life or a very happy one at that. So I believe that if I can get an office and when I get an office, I'll be able to address these issues and use my unique background to be able to bring a voice to these problems. Thank you. Ms. Robinson, your response? Can you remind me the question, please? Absolutely. What are two or three major issues that need to be addressed by the legislature? Thank you. Um, you know, 
my two top issues are behavioral health issues, which includes both mental health, health and substance uh, use issues, which are um, unfortunately continue to really plague so many individuals and families in our community. And then, and then the second top issue for me is uh, continuing to work on affordable housing and homelessness. Both of these are uh, large issues that I have worked on in the time that I've been in Olympia, and they continue uh, to need addressing in our uh, community. If there was a third uh, issue for me, I would have to say that was a strong public education system. Again, that is the paramount duty of our state. It is a, a big focus of the state legislature to make sure that all the communities in our state have strong schools and that all children have the ability to get a, a quality education. We have invested so much in behavioral health and we've made strides in this community. I'm proud of the beds that we brought online, both at Providence Hospital, through Snohomish County and through Compass Health but we just need to continue to do more. And then we need to integrate that with um, housing and homelessness so that people can have a safe place to live and, and uh, receive the care that they need. Thank, thank you. you. Ms. Azariah, your response? Yes, thank you so much. So as I speak to the people of the uh, 38th Legislative District, I find that uh, what my platform, my biggest three issues are their biggest three issues as well. And the, the first one that everybody is talking about is safety. And as we all know that uh, crimes have skyrocketed in the past few years, and we need to address that. And especially the laws that were passed last year that handcuffed the law enforcement needs to definitely be changed. Um, defunding the police is not the answer. I believe in investing in law enforcement with the right reforms. The second one that I hear all the time is affordability. You know, um, I was at somebody's house and um, the mother is so, she was in tears and she was saying that I cannot put food on the table. I'm losing my house. So affordability is a huge issue. Gas prices are going up. Grocery prices are going up all uh, there is inflation. So this needs to be addressed. And the third one I hear from my constituents is um, homelessness. And, uh, you know, that has been an issue forever and a day and probably is going to stay an issue. Uh, however, we need to address homelessness by providing homes, which right now we are in a crisis. We are 250,000 short. And we need to do that with proper services. Without services, it is Thank you. Thank you very much. It seems like you all are interested in talking with us a little bit about homelessness. So I'd like to give you a little time to give us more, please. Uh, Ms. Robinson, we'll start with you. I'm asking you to please speak to the ways that you would address homelessness. Thank you for that question. It is, uh, it seems to be an intractable problem in our community and in many communities around the state. We need to, um, strengthen our nonprofit housing providers in this community and, um, and also um, encourage our local communities to, um, by that I mean our cities, Snohomish County, to allow affordable housing and housing for home, people who are currently homeless to be built in their communities. Siting of affordable housing continues to be a problem. Um, we have taken steps to do things like put up pallet shelters that get people off the street. It's not a permanent solution, but it helps people have a door to lock behind them and feel safe and then uh, move from there into a, a, a more permanent housing situation. I think we need to continue to look at those kinds of solutions to mesh the behavioral health issues and the housing issues. Not everybody who needs affordable housing has behavioral health issues, but the two do tend to be intertwined. We need uh, supportive housing so that it's both affordable and provides services on site for the people there so that they can recover, stay in recovery, and then uh, 
contribute back into our community. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Robinson. Um, Ms. Azariah? Yes, thank you. So as we all know, homelessness has become a huge issue even in Snohomish County. And um, I totally agree that we should provide um, housing to, to homeless people. However, just providing housing is not the answer. We do need to provide uh, other services like uh, rehab services and mental health services. And without that, we are not putting our people on the right path to succeed uh, and become a productive part of the community again. Uh, also, there would be always people who would not accept that as an option. They, their lifestyle is living on the streets and they do not want um, to be housed anywhere. So we have to also differentiate between who is willing to accept housing with services and be on a path to success. It's very important, otherwise we are throwing our uh, tax dollars away. And, um, you know, uh, nonprofit giving to the nonprofits is a good, great idea, but is there enough accountability? Because it seems like it is going in a black hole where there's no accountability. So we need to set accountability measures so we are able to figure out a, a path of success and not a bandaid that is every time you put a bandaid and it's ripped and there is the homeless problem again. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Moody, your thoughts on homelessness? Well, <clears throat> having worked in the, in the environment for the last 34 years, I've dealt extensively with homeless people. And I understand some of the problems. And like um, my colleague um, Anita has said, that many people don't want services. A lot of them like the irresponsibility and the freedom and not having to be attached to the system. However, our biggest problem right now is that we're providing solutions that are turning into even greater problems because a lot of the uh, current solutions that they have by buying, renting hotel rooms and providing services, well, they are definitely a Band-Aid, but they're also dens of iniquity. Uh, law enforcement has been called to these places several times for drug addictions being or drugs being used in these properties, uh, prostitution and, uh, and all these other types of crimes that are just uh, abusive of the system. So I think we need to deal with the root cause of the problem. And that oftentimes is mental health. Mental health issues and drug addictions are the things that drive people out of their societies, their homes and into these problems or, or these cases of homelessness. And until we start to address that and change the heart of people, I think we need to use the carrot and the stick approach by allowing them to uh, be in services or get services while they're in custody and be able to get the problem solved at the, raw, at the root level. Because until we do that, we're just gonna keep putting a Band-Aid on the problem and the problem's gonna get worse because the newspapers just reported Snohomish County has a 10 year high in homeless problems. So all the stuff we've been doing ain't working. Thank you. Our next question, we'll go to Ms. Azariah. And it is this, as hospital mergers happen with greater frequency, do you have concerns about limited health care options in religious hospitals systems? What actions, if any, would you recommend? Um, that's a wonderful question. And um, we already have a shortage of beds and care providing for our, our people. And with the mergers happening with the hospitals, it is becoming less and less available uh, to the people living in the 38th district. Definitely uh, what needs to be done is um, more affordable health should be provided to all. Uh, healthcare is something that should be available to all. That is what I believe. And coming from a country that is a, a third world country, and I have seen how healthcare can affect families and I see it over here happening as well. So definitely that is a huge, um, huge issue that is growing faster than we can, we can imagine and it needs to be addressed very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moody, your thoughts on this question? Uh, just for clarity, will you repeat the question, please? Absolutely. As hospital mergers happen with greater frequency, do you have concerns about limited healthcare options in religious hospital systems? 
what actions, if any, would you recommend? I would first recommend is to dis distinguish between healthcare and religious care because uh, just because a religious organization is the one that started the hospital that does not make them um, uh, fair game to be targeted for controls or regulations without regular hospitals doing the same. And I would like to add, uh, back in the days when hospitals uh, became or before they became a corporation in a business, these uh, hospitals and institutions were run by places of charity and religious organizations. So I think we could go back to allowing that service of mercy and of grace to become part of their business model instead of making money and worrying about only the dollar. Um, I believe that the goal of healthcare should be for the benefit of the people that are providing, getting services done to them, such as getting them back to good health. Uh, the big pharma and the corporations that have just kind of been overseeing and, uh, and overtaking these, uh, these, these agents of mercy are just clouding the ability for them to reach out to the communities that they serve. So I think I would be able to look at the problem and try to say, let's find a way where we can take the business model, not worrying about the profit of the dollar and worry about the patient and getting them healthy and back into a functionality again in the society and the families that they come from. Thank you. Ms. Robinson, same question. Yes, thank you. This is a big issue. Um, in the 38th legislative district, we have one hospital and it's a Catholic hospital, part of a large Catholic health system um, in, in the Western US. And most, currently most of the hospitals in uh, the Puget Sound region are, at are affiliated with uh, Catholic health systems. Yes, they started out as uh, wonderful charity organizations, and unfortunately, our healthcare in the United States today is big business. I don't like that either, but that is what we have. We have worked in the legislature to ensure that, um, especially where options are limited, such as in Snohomish County, um, that patients that are uh, people living in the community will be guaranteed the full range of healthcare. So that means that people who are LGBTQ will get care, that people who need full reproductive care will be able to get that care, that people who want to make choices at the end of their life will be able to get uh, a full range of services available to them. We have passed legislation that makes it harder for providers in these um, health systems to be punished if they um, provide the full range of services. Um, I will be very honest, it's hard to do. Okay, thank you. Mr. Moody, next question is for you and it's regarding education and funding. How could the education funding system be adjusted to continue to improve equity in public school, even in the event of a local levy failure? Of a local levy failure. Okay. Well, the first thing I'd probably recommend as a citizen of the 38th for the last 25 years, every single election cycle, there is a levy in order to improve um, education system. And um, my, as a citizen, my question is constantly is, is what have they done with the money that I just approved for the last levy? And then how come it seems to be like the levy process of increasing this money is constantly being a part of the budget and uh, contract negotiations of the education system? It seems like the education system does everything but educate the people that are in it. So I would be definitely in supportive of, um, of school choice and of allowing people to be able to take their kids and allow them to go to schools where they get the best education, uh, spurring the competition of being able to create business out of the, the school system so that they will actually uh, aspire for excellence in the education, being able to get the education to the students so they become productive members of society. I think the big business and all the political wranglings that we've got going on in the school system today has just 
uh, undermine the whole purpose of why you want to send your child to school, and that is for an education so they can be self-supported through their own contributions and not dependent upon the government and or social services. So I would look at that possibility as being an answer to why we're spending so much money and getting people for it. Thank you. Ms. Robinson, your thoughts on the same question? Thank you. Well, it is the state's paramount duty per our state constitution to provide an uh, education for every child in the state of Washington. We have worked hard to try to address inequities and yet they, they continue to uh, exist. We had a, a lawsuit against the state several years ago uh, called the McCleary case, which was about this very thing. And as a result of that, the state um, invested much, many more state dollars into schools around the, around the state to try to even the playing field. Unfortunately, in our own district, in our own 38th legislative district, we do see particularly the Marysville School District and Everett, which have tried um, many times to pass levies, which are continuations. You know, when you pass a levy, it expires after a few years. And so you go out and try to continue that. It's not new uh, additional funding. You're continuing what you had. And it's hard in this current environment um, for we've seen many levies fail. And so how to make that more fair across the state is a big challenge. I suppose the way to do that theoretically would be for the state to pick up uh, more of the funding. However, again, our constitution sets up uh, a state local partnership around uh, funding education. Thank you. Ms. Azariah, your thoughts on the same question, please. Yes, thank you. So it is about our children. It is the state's duty to educate our children. However, sometimes the answer is not uh, to keep on putting money into a project, but also reassessing if there are areas that we are spending money on that we should not be. So I think we should reassess where the money is going. As Mr. Moody said, you know, sometimes we think we are paying all these taxes, the levies, uh, where is this money going? Because we are always in need of more and more money. Um, the other thing is, I believe that because it is about the children's education, uh, the money should follow the child and not the school. So it is very important that the parents have the ability to take their children wherever they uh, think that the child would get the best education. So it should not be attached to the school, but should follow the child. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Robinson, this question will start with you and it regards uh, our redistricting process. Are there changes that you would support to the Washington State redistricting process? If so, what would those be? Thank you for that question. Uh, we just went through uh, a redistricting process and although our state has what is held up um, by many as a standard for redistricting and that it is um, bipartisan and um, done outside of the legislature, um, we still saw uh, challenges with the current system. There are changes I would like to see. One would be that we completely remove the redistricting from uh, that the legislature, legislative staff no longer support the redistricting commission. I think that uh, was an issue that we, that um, became problematic um, in this current round. So I believe the redistricting commission should be its own entity with completely separate staff from the legislative uh, caucuses. I also think we should take a look at the neutral, um, uh, the, the one person, the, the uh, chair of the redistricting commission who is not appointed and who by the, the uh, caucuses and is um, a neutral person. I think we just need to look at the function of that person and you know they're they're a convener, but they're not a decision maker. 
Um, I, I think maybe if that person could have had a little more voice, Thank we you. would have seen a better outcome. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Um, Ms. Azariah, your, your thoughts. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I do agree with uh, Ms. Robinson over here that uh, redistricting panels should uh, probably be a third party, not involved with any of the parties. And, um, you know, in a very short, concise way, it should be bipartisan process with a good, diverse representation and with community engagement. And that is very essential to a fair process. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Moody, your thoughts, please. Well, <clears throat> I say we get rid of the entire redistricting idea completely because all it does is just favors the party that happens to be in power at the time. And it does, and it addresses nothing about the people that are living in the district. So the whole gerrymandering and the redistricting kind of stuff is just to give the consolidated power for whatever party happens to be in control so that their people will be able to have the strongest uh, success in areas that they may be weak in or to consult or to keep the power in the areas that they're strong in. So I don't even see how that that concept is even fair. So um, living in the district as long as I have and seeing all the different uh, times that we've uh, that we've went back and forth with uh, who's going to be in power and what districts are going to be where, um, I think it takes away from the true nature of representing the people that are living in the districts. And um, uh, the better outcome, well, you know, I mean, the only way you can get a better outcome is to keep the party that's, uh, that's doing the draw line drawing in power. So um, I think we should probably just consider uh, an option that might exist in a world where we don't even have the ability to redistrict. Let's just have the people vote, the people speak for the, the, the representatives that they want and have a government that is reflective and representative of the people and not some gerrymandering district. Thank you very much. Ms. Azariah, following the US Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe versus Wade, would you support making any changes to existing state laws regarding access to abortion? And if so, what would they be? Thank you. Um, so none of this um, has any effect on Washington state, certainly not in the short term manner. And in the long term, we all hope to see less abortions. Um, I believe that women and men um, they should be educated, they should have awareness of, um, you know, the process of abortion and the effects of it. So we need to provide counseling to the women and men involved in these abortions. And uh, we should all work towards having less abortions. At this point, I don't see that anything is going to change in Washington state. And my constituents in 38th are more concerned about the affordability issues, the safety issues, and the homelessness and human rights issues that they are facing right now. When I doorbell every day, you know, I hear those issues. Hardly anybody uh, asks me a question about abortion. So my focus is on the community issues that we face together as one community and not, uh, you know, the thing that is not really affecting in the short term sense. Thank you so much. And thank you. Mr. Moody, same question for you. Mm, would you repeat the question again? Absolutely. Thank you. Following the U.S. Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe versus Wade, would you support making any changes to existing state laws regarding access to abortion? And if so, what would those changes be? Um, I agree with... Um with Ms. Azariah about the fact that Washington state will probably suffer no consequential change that, um, um, that we already have. Uh, Washington state is probably, um, in some opinions, they might consider themselves a leader in this, uh, in this venue. Um, I look at uh, the abortion issue as being a personal one because my mom, if she was living today and had the conditions of, of my birth, 
around everyone that, that knew her would tell her to get an abortion. So I think if we use abortion for the purpose of birth control, that's not good. And so um, going into the big business of abortion, that is my biggest concern because Planned Parenthood seems to be the, the, money, the money supporter behind a lot of the education systems that want to teach sex education in the schools, including the last bills that we just got through being passed. If you looked into them, they were backed by uh, Planned Parenthood. I look at Planned Parenthood as being the Negro project because that was where originally it came from. And I also look at Planned Parenthood as being a business. I, li I can look out my window and I'm looking at on the top of Planned Parenthood and I see the, 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 the visceral fights and the anger and the hatred that happens on there. That's not good. That's not good for the health of the people that go there for services. That's definitely not good for the babies that, uh, that don't come out of those places. So I think we should probably consider the fact that the road versus Wade gives the power back to the state where it belongs. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Robinson, your thoughts on this issue? Thank you. Washington state currently does have fairly strong um, laws protecting a, a woman's access to safe legal abortion. And I will do everything that I can to make sure that we maintain that. I am concerned about um, women coming from out of state to Washington um, to uh, particularly, you know, one of our border states does not allow abortion or is won't very soon. Um, so I wanna, you know, I'm, I'm watching the data about how many women come from out of state, what kinds of services they're receiving and whether we need to make adjustments uh, to make sure that we continue to be a safe place for people to come. Um, I think at this point, I am not, um, I'm not looking to make changes, uh, but I am certainly looking to um, maintain uh, the strong protections that we have and that quite frankly, the voters of Washington have voted on in the past. And so we wanna make sure that we maintain that access for women in this state. Thank you. Mr. Moody, this question will start with you. Um, what legislation will you support to address the need for local responses to climate change, including through the comprehensive plans for the Growth Management Act? Well, I definitely believe that um, we need to take care of the planet that God has given us and entrusted it to our care. I believe that the pollution and some of the things that we have created as uh, part of our uh, population growth and expansion has definitely threatened to put some of the um, dangers of destroying ecosystems that, uh, that may not never come back. However, one of the things that I don't necessarily support is the fact of the idea that mankind themselves is the virus to the planet and therefore we need to control or get rid of man in order to be able to control or protect the environment. I think we, um, we should be good stewards of this paradise island that we're given. And I believe that we could find ways of being able to create businesses that would get, allow us to um, expand the uh, recycling efforts and expand the, uh, the clean water efforts and stop polluting our water. We've lived for thousands of years in the uh, environment we lived in without having to pollute it nearly as much as we have. And the only reason why we're doing so now is because of technology and the advancement of society. So I think we should be able to look at ways of being able to curtail that in order to be able to keep our planet healthy and green again. Thank you. Ms. Robinson, same question. Thank you. Well, we almost passed a bill last session and I did support it that would have included, um, would have required that as communities update their comprehensive plans that they need to include uh, climate change elements in those updates. I know Snohomish County is already taking action to do that on their own without the law and I certainly support that. I will look for that uh, legislation to come forward again this year and will support it. I think that's 
really what we need is we need a lot of things to address climate change, but in terms of planning at our at the local level, if we can ensure that uh, climate change is incorporated into the long range planning of the comprehensive plan, and that will take us a big step forward. Um, the state also should support our local communities in their efforts around that through um, grants. And uh, we do always provide uh, grant funding to counties um, as they work through their uh, comprehensive planning process. And I would certainly support that again in the future. Thank you. Ms. Azariah, your thoughts on this issue? Thank you so much. We have such a beautiful state and um, I would love to see the state stay like this for our future generations to come so they can enjoy what we have. We definitely uh, are playing our part to create pollution, uh, but I believe education and awareness is the key to everything. So we need to invest in educating um, the people of this county, the state, what is important to do um, with the Growth Management Act, you know, uh, providing sustainable solutions to growth, transportation, uh, property permit processes, um, environmental uh, processes, and the protection and early public participation uh, is the key. Uh, and we should do our part in making sure that. Um, we are dealing with this issue in a way so our future generations can enjoy what we have. So it's really important for us to be uh, involved and understand what are the factors that are creating uh, the environment to get polluted and we need to start at home. And that's what I believe it starts from. Every person has a part to play in this and we need to ed uh, educate our future generations how to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Robinson, this question is for you. What do you believe are the three best ideas for reducing the likelihood of violent firearm incidents in our county and state? Uh, well, We have, uh, either through citizen initiative or through laws, we have um, put into place some of the uh, policies that I believe are helpful. Um, one is requiring background checks for all firearm purchases. Uh, we do have safe storage uh, practices in law currently, again, through citizen initiative. I would like to see assault weapons uh, banned the sale of assault weapons. I don't think anybody needs uh, an assault weapon to um, defend themselves or their family. And I think that would uh, be helpful. Um, I think um, raising the age for purchase. Um, we now know that uh, a lot of the gun violence is committed uh, by quite frankly, young men between the ages of 18 and 24. And so looking at that and how can we um, uh, put into place uh, more restrictions perhaps, or um, really we need to go back and provide education, I think, um, in, to all young people about conflict resolution and um, thinking about other ways to resolve uh, conflict than taking out a gun. Thank you so much. Ms. Azariah, same question. Yes, thank you so much. I would agree with uh, Ms. Robinson on educating because as an educator, I believe that awareness and education is the answer of most of the issues that we are having. We should have proper processes in place to ensure, ensure that guns do not go into hands of criminals. Uh, we have to keep the guns away from criminals, not law abiding citizens. Now this is our second amendment right, but with rights, uh, all, there are always responsibilities. So we have to take the responsibility of educating our children. Um, what is the proper way to use the guns? Also criminals need to be prosecuted. <clears throat> excuse me, they need to be prosecuted. And this catch and release process that it, 
that we see all the time, uh, that is not working. Crime is skyrocketing because of that. Uh, just recently in a school uh, in our legislative district, uh, the school shooter was actually released on a $250 bail the very next day. And this is not the answer to all of this. There are mental health issues that need to be dealt with. There are, uh, you know, education and awareness issues that uh, we need to deal with. So it is not the problem of actually gun. It is the problem of not being aware how to use guns. Properly. Thank you. Mr. Moody, same question, please. Well, my uh, quickest answer and easiest answer would be is just to keep firearms out of the hands of criminals because every person who has committed a violent act of, of um, with using a gun is a criminal and, and uh, committing a criminal act. So having laws or raising age and doing all the little things that, you know, we like to say that would make us look like we're doing something about it is not necessarily the answer. The answer that we're going to find is to change the hearts and minds of some of the people who are using these guns. There was a time in school, and I remember because I used to do it, where we had firearms class in school. They taught us how to hunt. They taught us how to use firearms safely. We brought guns to school, all these rifles. And, um, you know, nobody shot everybody up. Nobody shot the schools up. So when these incidences happen, to take a, a, uh, a bend or, or as a holistic approach by just saying, let's get rid of all guns, well, that's not the answer because the ones that are going to be using the guns against the people who don't have them are going to be the criminals. So law-abiding citizens don't need to have yet more restrictions. And as um, Ms. Azariah said that, you know, it is our constitutional right. So we need to find a way to balance it instead of saying that the constitution needs to be changed or you need to get rid of the amendment so that we can take away these rights and not allow law-abiding citizens the ability to either enjoy the sportsmanship of fighting or hunting and being able to use um, uh, standard rules that will be able to applicable to criminals, not law citizens. Thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Azariah, if elected, what ideas do you have for working productively with your staff, colleagues, and members of the public whose ideas are different from yours? Well, this is a wonderful question because I've faced this all my life coming from another country, coming into a, you know, a country which has a different culture, language. I had to adapt. I had to listen. I had to uh, get myself into uh, what they call the American culture. And the be beauty about this country is we call it a melting pot. We have people from all over the world and we have a diversity that we don't see in any other country in the world. But that being said, I'm a good listener. I listen. I'm meeting a lot of people as I've done all my life uh, that I've spent in the US, 29 years. I have worked in different fields. I have listened, I've listened to the issues. And that is exactly what I'm going to do uh, when I get elected um, as a Senator, I would be listening to the constituents, what their issues are. Yes, you know, I could have some of my own uh, ideas that this is a priority, but the basic thing is we need to start listening to the constituents of our community. We need to hear what issues they are facing and then address them appropriately, bring solutions to the table that are sustainable. So I would be doing exactly the same with the staff and other people who I would be working with. I totally believe that we need to work together to heal the divide. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moody, your question. You're muted, Mr. Moody. You are muted. Let's just give him a minute and see if he can come back. Um, Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Well, yes, I can. I got a, a warning sign that says the moderator muted me because I didn't mute myself. Um, so, but anyway, it's it's back now. Thank so, you. Um, uh, would you repeat the question, please, just so I can get a fresh? Yes. Okay. If elected, what ideas do you have for working productively with your staff, colleagues, and members of the public 
whose ideas are different from yours. Thank you. Well, the first thing I would do is probably the same thing that I'm doing right now because I am working with a bunch of people who have different opinions than, than the guy that sleeps in the same cell with them or the next cell next to him. Um, I believe that uh, once I'm elected, I'll be able to, I would hope that I can be able to teach and fold, mold my, my staff so that they understand that we have a clear mission and a clear vision as to what we're there for and what we're, what we're trying to do and what, who we serve. I think the legislators currently have kind of forgotten a little bit about the fact that they are there by the behest of the people and for the service of the people. So I would try to create a team of people that would be focused on the same thing, and that is to improve services to the members of our district and the citizens that live in them. I would hope that we would be able to open up uh, communication outlets that would be able to contact uh, uh, the senators or the representatives that we would, we, when we're not in session, we would come back home and uh, go around to some of the local neighborhood boards, communicate with them. Um, if my team members, and I'm not sure all the, the uh, nuances of what my team would be, because I'm not in there yet, but, uh, but if I could bring them and allow them to be a part of those, uh, those conversations, I would do that as well. Most importantly, that we have to realize why we're there and who we serve and then how are we going to do it and then leave the service that we've done better than what we found it. Thank you. Ms. Robinson, same question. Thank you. The legislative process is all about taking ideas that are different than yours and uh, crafting legislation that will work around the state. Washington is a very diverse state in many ways, in age, in ethnicity, in urban, rural, political persuasion, uh, religion. I mean, we all come from different places and um, it's hard to take your idea and listen to others and take their suggestions for how to make, the, make it better and make it work better. Um, so I have done that repeatedly um, as a legislator, as a representative of the 38th legislative district. I hear constantly from people who don't agree with me, who have different ideas, and you take those ideas and mold them um, into a better product um, that will address uh, the issues that you're trying to solve. Thank you. And this is our final question. And I believe we have enough time. You all have been so wonderful this evening. We have enough time to extend the amount of time. I'd like to ask the timer to set it to uh, two minutes. And we're going to start with uh, Mr. Moody. Mr. Moody, our last question is this. What additional issues or information would you like to bring to the attention of the community? You fentanyl. have two minutes. In a word, fentanyl. Fentanyl right now is an epidemic in our culture, in our society. We have allowed, for whatever reasons, to open the floodgates of having these, this particular drug to come into our society and to kill our citizens. Fentanyl is 50 times more powerful than um, heroin. 100 times more powerful than other opiates. We are losing people in droves. It is not being reported accurately, in my opinion, by the media. And I think there may be a reason for that. But I know one thing, working in the jail on a, any given night, there are times when I am the direct supervisor of the booking area where we will have every single person that comes into, it comes into the jail that has either fentanyl on them or in them. So this drug is going to wipe out an entire generation of people if we don't do something about it. It is the catalyst for a lot of the uh, criminal activity as well as the homelessness that runs around in our streets. I, I dare say that any person that you see sitting on the, on the bench, and I even have a videotape over at, at Walmart when I was coming out of uh, Panda, Panda Express to get for having lunch, where there was almost like an open air drug market where people were just sitting there taking drugs, sharing drugs, and the broad daylight and wide up. Matter of fact, they were watching me film them. 
And so, um, it, and it's just not being paid attention to. Some of the laws that the legislators currently have, they've been in power for over 30 years. So all of these problems that we have in our society and our district has to be laid at the feet of the party that's in power right now. And all that they have tried to do by throwing money at it don't work. We need to have law enforcement. Thank you. Ms. Robinson, same question, please. Thank you. Well, I'd like to um, talk about building community and uh, finding respect for ourselves and, and for our neighbors. It's been a challenging two years. Um, we've, we're still in the midst of a COVID pandemic. We've been through lockdowns. We've been through a lot of loss and hurt. And, um, and, and then layered on top of that, we've seen the racial reckoning that our country has gone through. We are seeing rising crime. It's a nationwide issue and we are seeing it here in Snohomish County uh, as well. Um, we need to continue to reach out to each other and build community. And that's what I hope to do as a legislator is to provide people opportunities to receive the services that government can offer them um, in, a, in ways that uh, build their families and their opportunities and their ability to live in community with one another. Um, take time to reach out to the people around you and ask them how they're doing and respond and listen. Take a meal to a neighbor, um, sit on your front porch, these are all the things that I would like to bring um, to our community in this really challenging time when we feel so separated and so divided from each other, but we need to see each other's humanness and um, try to find ways to talk to each other and get to know each other in a respectful way. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Ms. Azariah. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so as I, I was doorbelling, there was a lady that opened the door and I asked her what her biggest concern is. And she looked at me and she just shook her head like this. And she said, we don't get along anymore. We don't get along. And that is a huge issue on a personal level, on the political level, as a community, as a nation, we are not getting along. So we need to really, really work on that in a very bipartisan way, uh, leave all the politics behind. I'm not a politician. I am a person who lives in this, this community and I am facing the same issues that everybody else is facing, which is of course, you know, safety, affordability, a human rights issue. But I would also like to bring that we have uh, due to this pandemic, our small businesses have shut down. We need to build them back again because strong businesses mean strong community. Uh, there is obviously a drug issue. Uh, with the rise in drug um, drugs, it brings crimes to the community and there is an affordability crisis. We also need to address our education. I believe that there should be complete transparency in the education system and the parents should be able to decide what their children are going to be taught in school. So uh, to put everything together, you know, everything is interconnected, it's related. We just need to be more caring about the community, leave our party politics behind, work together with each other, and build this community back to where it should be, where we are all caring about each other. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Azariah. The League appreciates these candidates for joining us and for running for office. A recording of this forum and others will be available on the League of Women Voters of Snohomish County website and YouTube channel. Find links at lwvsnoho.org. We encourage you to explore additional information about these and all candidates. The Snohomish County voter pamphlet will be mailed to residences starting July 13th. Vote411.org, sponsored by the League of Women Voters, is another good source for nonpartisan voting information. 
Ballots will be mailed on July 15th and election day is August 2nd. Please vote. This concludes our candidate forum. Again, thank you all for joining us and please be a voter.